Welcome, welcome to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, a humble human on a mission here to help you both look and feel your best. Now, you all know that my six favorite F words lately are family, faith, fun, freedom, fitness, and finances. And we have an incredible guest here for you all today. This is Adam Alred. We're getting a little bit of a masculine perspective (laughs) on this whole radiance stuff that you know I love to talk about. It's not just about looking great in a picture. It's not just about having great hair, skin, nails, having a great outfit, but it's showing up with this energy and really living, being of service, knowing ourselves and having great relationships with ourselves, our professional colleagues, and also in our relationships. So Adam Alred, great to have you here on the show. Love for you to introduce yourself. First of all, I'd love to ask you the unlimited dollar question that I can't rejuvenate for you. Everyone, you got to learn this stuff. What is radiance to you? Rachel, that is a, uh, that's a good question. I've actually never been asked that question, but I, I think about radiance a lot because it is something that you observe in people. And uh, I think even sometimes you can see it in yourself. I don't see it in myself enough. I think I need more radiance. Um, but I think when I observe somebody who is radiant, if I see somebody that I would describe as having radiance, it's, it's just like you said a minute ago, it's the energy that they're putting out. There's a certain type of energy. And I think energy doesn't lie. You know, you can have these interactions with people and everybody has their identity and they have their, uh, what they're kind of their representative in a lot of ways they're presenting to the world. And when somebody is radiant, you're actually seeing their authenticity. You're seeing their inner self, the beauty that they have within themselves. And so to me, it's the most attractive quality somebody can have. We were talking about this a little bit before the show, but to me, the most attractive quality in somebody is authenticity. When somebody's authentically who they are, there's a certain radiance with that. And when they are authentically who they are and they are trying their best to make themselves in the world a better place, there's just something that's undeniable about it. You can see it in their, in their eyes. You can see it in their countenance. That's uh, without having ever given that question the thought that it deserves. <laughs> so that's how I would answer that. I'd love for you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Um, this is going to be kind of like a bite-sized show here. Adam's going to be back for part two. I, I truly think he's got a lot of really great things to share, both for the male and the female listeners here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Adam, what you're all about, what you know, you're know you doing on social media, because that's how I found you. I felt like your message was something that I really resonated with, especially with the masculine and feminine dynamics and, you know, how you really have to kind of get back to these basics that, um, we've, you know, there's been some programming to, you know, get women look working like the corporate woman, you know, perimenopause, menopause, so hard on them, not to mention in the relationship side of things too. So you're really bringing back these, these basics to, you know, the, male and female roles, but I would just love to hear from you a little bit about you and what you're all about and how you're at service. Yeah. Um, I'll try to try to keep it brief. I, um, I was born in Utah. I grew up here until I was about six and my dad was in the service and we did, he did 30 years in the service. So for my formative years, we traveled kind of all over the world, which was an incredible experience. It had its drawbacks, but, um, one of the things that I learned because you're constantly moving or your friends are constantly moving because they're in their dads or moms are in the military as well is you learn how to make friends and, uh, or if you don't, you're going to have a pretty sad stretch of time in the military. Um, but you learn how to make friends and you learn how to build up kind of a tribe around you. And and that was a skill that I've used my entire life. And I'm really grateful for my military kind of upbringing that way to be able to make friends. When I got, uh, done with high school, I went on an LDS mission. So I'm from Utah. It's usually, there's a 50, 50 chance somebody from Utah is Mormon. And I went on an LDS mission to California, learned a lot of things there, came back having knocked doors. Cause that's what you do as a missionary. And in Utah, they've got this weird subculture of door knockers where these kids have gone on missions, a lot of them held LDS missions, and they've come back and learned how to monetize their skill set. <laughs> so they know how to knock doors. And so they figured out how to create these companies that have door knockers. And so they get these kids that come off their mission. I was one of them. I got sent out to uh, my first summer. I got recruited by uh, a buddy of mine named Riley Edwards. We went out to Detroit. So I was 22 at the time. And I was trying to figure out a way to pay for college. And, uh, you know, they promise you you can make a lot of money knocking on doors. And I 
you know, signed up and went out to Detroit and uh, just haven't ever looked back. It became the way I paid for school. I did it every summer while I was going to college. It took me, oh, seven years to get a four-year English degree because <laughs> I was uh, I was making a lot of money knocking doors. It turned out to be a really good program for me. And, uh, and then ultimately, when I graduated from college, I started up a door-to-door sales company myself, went out to Philadelphia, started a garbage company. And uh, my partner and I thought we were going to stay there for the long haul. It was, everything was working really well for us. Uh, in Philly, it's an interesting place in the garbage world because it's all the leftovers of this, these mafia guys. So it's like the guys that didn't end up in the, in the landfill or sleeping with the fishes or in jail. It's like the nephews and whoever else are running all the garbage companies, all these old Italian guys. And, and so it was this culture clash between these two Mormon kids from Utah and all these old Italian guys. And we're buying these old trucks and putting new kit coats of paint on them and trying to compete with these guys. And eventually uh, they, we were doing so well with our door knockers, knocking on people's doors and signing them up for our garbage service that these uh, one of these companies made us an offer we couldn't refuse, so to speak. They kept making us offers to buy us out, to get us out of the market. We kept saying no. And eventually they made us an offer. We were just like, it's kind of, more than we could make in six or seven years. So we took the, took the offer, came back and started up pest control companies doing door to door sales. We started first in the Northwest and now up in Seattle and up in uh, Portland. And now we're kind of all over the country and we build up primarily, we have a lot of different marketing strategies, but our primary marketing strategy is door to door sales and door to door sales. I mean, people can probably guess at just how miserable it is. You wake up every day and you go out and knock on doors and people are you know, having a bad day or they're not interested in talking to you. And so you get a lot of rejection and a lot of people say no to you and you learn how to just kind of scoop up your self-esteem and keep yourself going and keep knocking doors. And you learn a lot of resilience and you learn a lot of grit and uh, you can make some really good money doing it, which is, you know, how we we started these businesses. Um, The reason why we started these businesses is because we, we knew there was a lot of, a lot of return on this. If we could build them up the right way, there is an incredible, incredibly cool culture in door-to-door sales. You pay a high price for it with the difficulty of the work, the nature of it, but it's really like a high motivational uh, environment and you're doing really, really hard things. It doesn't feel like you're working for a job. It feels more like you're on a sports team every morning you wake up and you have like a rah-rah meeting with your with your team and you get fired up to go face the day and all the challenges, the challenges that it's going to bring. Um, that was has been something that has shaped my life more than I can articulate this type of door to door sales culture, not only kind of coming up through it, but then now owning companies that do door to door sales and creating that culture and creating the incentives and the training and the mindset that that a lot of these younger kids like college kids like myself, um, it, it just develops them in such a way that's profound. And I always tell guys, you know, the money you make is great, but the experience and the character building that you're going to take away from this is going to be far more valuable to you than anything you earn in money, money wise. And as I've kind of broadened out of door-to-door sales into other business ventures, um, I've just real, I realized how few men have access to this type of culture in their lives. I run into so many guys that are in dead end jobs. They have no friends. They have a marriage that's struggling. If they haven't already been devastated by a divorce, they, they don't know what it even means to be a man. In a lot of cases, you know, they were raised in the feminine energy without a dad around, They roll into a school system that's predominantly females and they come out of that conditioned to kind of be subservient to the female energy, which isn't healthy for anybody. In my opinion, they come out kind of being a yes man to the female energy and thinking that life is going to start for them as soon as they can find something like another motherly figure for them, a woman that's going to, you know, kind of take them under their wing and tell them what to do and, and basically be the, the answer to all their life's problems. And I mean, in all honesty, that's the last thing a woman wants in a relationship, women, I'm speaking from experience, love the leadership, love the protection, love the provision of what the masculine brings. And uh, it's really key. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And the sales and the resilience and the grip part, the most intelligent people I come across are in sales. Because you're so good at identifying what someone's needs are and how you can serve them and these interpersonal skills. I just wanted to say that, but please continue on. I love hearing your story here, Adam. No, yeah, you're. I think you're spot on. And that's something that I've observed is that it it's interesting kind of irony that women will say that they want certain things sometimes. And guys do this as well. This isn't a female thing. This is a human thing, um, but not really being self-aware of that. So a lot of times women will get, feel um, maybe attacked or feel uh, like, the feminine energy is being put down when you talk about raising men up and making them more masculine, which is not the case at all. In fact, I think 
you, you can't really be in your feminine energy or in your masculine energy unless you're with the feminine energy and with the masculine energy. I don't know if that makes sense, but for a woman to be in her feminine energy, I think she needs to have in a relationship, she needs to have masculine energy that she can rely on. And too often guys are just not stepping up to that because they don't know how to do it or they don't know they should do it. Uh, and so they acquiesce to the female in the relationship and then she doesn't have any respect for him and she doesn't have any confidence for him or trust in him. He's not, he's not the rock or the leadership that she can kind of be safe in that space with. And so I've just seen a lot of marriages go south. And in, in fact, I was married for eight and a half years. I got, I was married for the first time when I was 30 and I made a lot of those mistakes. I felt like it was my job to basically be the servant to my wife and to just kind of uh be the yes man in a lot of ways and it didn't help our relationship at all and in fact you know after eight and a half years of a lot of different factors that wasn't just it but a lot of different factors it ended in a divorce and it was by far the hardest thing that i've ever gone through in my entire life uh but i learned so much from that experience i, I am so grateful that i went through that as hard and as challenging as it was to be able to learn the things that i learned has, has changed the completely the trajectory of my life. And I'm in a marriage now where I learned, took those lessons to heart and it's incredible. It's vibrant. Like I am playing the masculine role in the relationship and my wife is comfortable in her feminine energy. And we have this just beautiful dynamic relationship that I wish for everybody. And so, you know, seeing so many men that I interact with, not understanding a lot of these things, myself included for a time and not having friends around to, to talk with, to share these types of, these types of experiences with, uh, I, I felt compelled for years that I needed to start kind of talking about some of this stuff that I'd learned and not really knowing how to do it or, um, what I should say. I just got out of camera with my buddy and started filming some content. I was just editing it. I had no idea what I was doing, uh, putting it out there into the, into the social media ether and, uh, was, and it was, and still am genuinely surprised at how many people it's resonated with. I've had a lot of people like follow me and, and love the content. I've had a lot of people push back on it as well. It's just kind of the space we're in. So there's a lot of negativity as well, but the positivity has far outweighed the negativity. And in fact, within one of my first reels, I mean, I didn't have any followers when I started, when I, my, one of my first reels, it was like the fourth or fifth reel that I put out, it hit like a, uh, almost 2 million views and it was just crazy. And so that since then, it's just, kind of taken off and uh i'm still just trying to hang along for the ride <laughs> i don't know exactly where it's going to go um and i'm still grateful but honestly surprised that you know i'm just kind of talking my mind and my thoughts and, and people care to listen to it it's 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 encouraging but also kind of humbling <laughs> yeah i mean this is part of your role it's it seems like it's giving people things to think about with themselves encouraging them to start to do the inner work and then having more balanced relationships. And at the end of the day, we're going to be a much stronger society when our families are together. And there's so much of your story that for those of you who have been tuning into the show, you know that I've gone through quite a bit over the last couple of years too, and spent the uh, last few years actually traveling quite a bit and was in Utah for a good chunk of time a few times. And I love the culture. I love the vibe. I have, you know, lots of LDS friends there. Pretty much, you know, most people that live in Utah are LDS. It's, it's very well known, huge families. You know, they, you see these vans that I go to volleyball practice <laughs> with or <laughs> games with, and it's one family. Uh, but the family unit is really cool. But the other thing that's really interesting about the culture where you are, which I actually really like, is the survivalism right? It's, it's it, it, the prepper. I mean, that's the stereotype. And a couple of years ago, when, as, as you know, I'm, I'm from Canada and uh, during the pandemic, it, it was a tough time. It's like, what's happening? And that actually really shifted me into more of a hyper-masculine role. I got a, you know, huge badass lift at four by four. I was off-roading once or twice a week, hiking, uh, you know, 12 miles at a time with a big pack, making fires. And I was doing this all with, you know, my girlfriends and, and uh, not with, with other uh, parties. And it just really shifted me into this hyper masculine role. And I was learning all these skills to potentially become, uh, do search and rescue. But little did I know I actually needed to rescue myself. And so I'm happy to say that now I'm in my soft feminine era 
And I even, you know, you'll find this interesting, Adam, when I look at pictures and videos of myself, even just from three years ago, the way that I would carry myself, I'd be in this big plaid men's lumberjack jacket. Uh, so I, and I have a beanie on, black beanie, big sunglasses, kind of like hide my blonde hair when I'm on the trails. And there's all sorts of shen shenanigans out that way. So kind of like hiding my beauty and my feminine energy so that I felt more safe and learning all these skill sets so that I felt more safe. And it, it took me a while to realize that that wasn't the way. There was something off. I was in two car crashes, got into the health, got into the biohacking stuff, been doing it for years. And now that I've become more pure with biohacking, I do research on oxidative stress and inflammation, how we can get great skin. But then I noticed that, wow, my brain's working better and I'm more relaxed now. And I learned how to communicate. I learned sales. I learned how to do sales. And that resilience and that grit in people that do sales, um, I, I did definitely find that they're more intelligent. So just a little bit about my story for you to hear. Listeners already know the stuff. Did my long fast in, in um, Arizona and Utah area. Totally changed my physiology. Simulated autophagy, hormesis. Dropped like, you know easily 10 pounds doing that skin started to shine better because I had more clarity because I was more detoxed. I'd love to hear from you, you know, listening to what I just shared, obviously there's a lot more involved in that in my own personal story, but this concept of more self-awareness, identifying who we really are, removing programs, doing the heavy lifting, getting into the flow state of life with who you really are. I think is more important than ever. It's not just about skincare. It's not just about rejuvenation, trying to put a Band-Aid on something that's maybe underlying with the confidence side of things. But how do you find the difference and the shifts in people who they start to do the inner work and how much confidence it brings them? Yeah, that's a, that's a question, a great question and something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. You know, I'm a Christian uh, as well. You're Christian. And uh, we have a, a, a kind of a purpose in life in that. But I, you know, the, the older that I've gotten, um, the more time that I've had to be with myself, the more I think that the purpose of life really is self-awareness. I think that's really what we're trying to do down here is to learn who we are. We're put into this circumstance in this life, uh, these, these experiences uh, that shape us and they're ultimately revealing us to ourselves if we're paying attention and if we're doing the heavy work. And I think, you know, people think they're conscious, so they're self-aware. And I'm just realizing more and more how, how much lack of self-awareness I have on this journey. You know, it's like the further you get, the further you see, you have to go like the more there is, but I think that's really, just when life. you think you've done enough work, <laughs> you never had, if you think you, if you think you've arrived, then you're, 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 usually way off base. I think like it's, there's no, I don't think there's any arrival at this. I just think it's, really the the beauty in life is to discover who you really are what you really want out of life and then going after it and it's really it's a really complicated thing to do i think uh because there is so much programming and there's so much stuff that we inherit from our upbringing and there's so much you know so many influences in the world that are trying to condition us or get us to think a certain way this tribalism this these politics is you know cultural differences or diversity like to kind of put us into a lane and tell us that's who we are and tell us what to do and how to think and um and I think so many of us don't lack the self-awareness to see that that's what's happening. And so we think our identity is really is our own when re in reality, we're living the identity that others have handed to us. Um, I, I, I happen to think that we're all basically just biological computers. And so you're going to run on the programming that you put into your head, like whatever you listen to, whatever you read, whoever you surround yourself with is ultimately going to be uh, how you mold and what you mold into and shape into. And self-awareness, I don't think is saying that there's no programming to me. Self-awareness is when you recognize that there's programming and then conscientiously choosing the programming that you want for your life, uh, whatever that looks like. So, you know, for me, I have this, these seven, we call them the seven articles of, of masculinity or seven articles of being a man. And one of them is, you know, the warrior masculinity that you got to be in physical good condition. You got to take care of yourself. Uh, the other I mean, one, what, is, what woman doesn't like that? You know, <laughs> well, it's it protected and safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel, I feel 
I feel grateful that I'm in good physical condition so that I'm, when, when I'm out with my wife, she feels safe. If we're walking down the street at night, like we were this weekend for my well, you're birthday. You're probably packing too. I mean, let's be honest here. What's that? <laughs> you're probably packing too. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, of course you, you, you got to, there's something about a man that if you want to have self-respect, at least for me, that you have to on some level be dangerous. You got to be capable of violence if necessary. And I'm not a violent person, but I want to be capable of it. And I've had moments where I've had to be violent and those are far and few between, but uh, those moments are important. I think that you are in a position that you can, you can stand up for yourself and you can stand up for others, particularly those on your watch. So there's these, these, these seven different articles for being a man. And all of those are articles now or things that are purposes for me that I try to make sure I'm feeding myself the right programming on those types of things, being really conscientious about what I choose to listen to on those topics and what I choose, you know, to ingest in, into myself on that, what I'm going to like let run the programming and as I've been really conscientious about choosing my programming, I've seen myself level up in all of these different aspects and just get better at it. And it it's really, it, it makes life really rewarding. It makes life really fun. One of your F, one of your Fs is it makes life really, really fun. But I also think that's where radiance comes from inside is when you feel like, you know, who you are and you like who you are. There's something novel about liking yourself that I think a lot of people don't have, but just like learning to like the person that you are, this thing that you're creating is has been um, really, really rewarding. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about with protection. I mean, I have a couple of situations to share here. Uh, one where I had to practice situational awareness and the other one where I could completely turn it off. And this is what happened when I was doing my long fast. I basically had a, a tour guide protector so I could go off and play in the streams, the you know Angel River of Sedona. It was totally magical. And just kind of do my own thing. And it actually felt really biblical doing this fast in the desert in altitude for, I think it's about six days or so. And I could just be in my phone and it felt so good. And, you know, lived in the States for six months at a time, quite a bit last year in the South, primarily uh, in Florida, felt very safe there, actually a lot of um, police presence for, I guess, a good reason. Uh, but felt very safe. And then back here in Canada, I got followed the other day through six turns and actually had to um, had to report it. And uh, when a woman doesn't feel safe, you know what that did to me? I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep for like three days because I was nervous. There was the potential for a threat and all of these things. And so when men show up, and show leadership in the protection side of things. Like you think of a priestess back in the day, they had their guards so that they could do whatever they had to do. And we, we really forget about how important that is. And for me personally to have witnessed that firsthand of just what that beautiful masculine protection does to the feminine, it just makes your nervous system, a woman's nervous system like honey. And a big part for women to show up as beautiful, radiant women is to be in the frequency of peace. Peace, love, and joy are the, the three highest vibrations. You know, fear, shame, and guilt are the lowest. So to be radiant, you have to feel safe. And having, you know, the self-awareness of thoughts that are impacting you or or situations around you where you don't feel safe, it's going to kind of chip away at that brightness. But there's this other quality too of when, and I hear this quite a bit, especially for those in the membership, when you start to show up and you're giving off more of this really high wattage beauty, you do become attractive to, uh, you know, there's some unwanted attention that can come with that. So for you hearing that, and then for women kind of like sometimes just wanting to kind of play it down like I used to and when I'd be on the trails with my lumberjack jacket and a beanie, what do you think when you hear a, a woman talk about kind of dimming their light or dimming their beauty to feel more safe? What, is it, what does that make you feel? Honestly, it makes me feel, um, uh, what's the right word for it? It makes me feel sad for the state of affairs with masculinity, to be honest with you, that men are not stepping up and doing a better job of that. And I, I don't exactly fault men for this because I think there's a whole societal issue with the reason why men aren't stepping up 100%. being more masculine. And we could, we could dig more into that, but 
that's something that I've learned more and more over the last few years is exactly what you're saying, that women are in their feminine space when they are safe, which is hard for a lot of guys to grasp because for most of us men, on some level, we recognize that masculinity is not built in safety. It's built in adversity. It's built in trials. It's built in like taking risks and falling down and getting back up and taking your hits. And this is how kind of a man becomes a man. He comes into his masculine energy. I don't think most of us understand or appreciate how dangerous the world can be for, for, for women. And, um, because we don't see that a lot of times we don't step up when we should, we don't understand that not just for physical protection of women, but also for emotional protection. I think with my wife now, one thing that I've learned is that I have to be really, really conscientious about the type of emotions and energy that I bring home so that she feels safe in her emotions as well, so that she can tell me about things that are going on in her day. And she knows I'm going to listen to her. I'm going to take it seriously. And it's going to mean something to me. And that when I get home, I get sometimes flack on this. I don't bring my problems home to my wife at all. Like I talk to her about stuff that's going on in my day, but I do not want to unburden the negativity from the day, you know, being, being in the work, in the world and kind of carving out your, your, uh, your future and your success out of this, like com very competitive place that we're in, in business. There's a lot of stress and a lot of headache. And my wife sometimes can feel that when I come home, cause I'll just feel like I got my ass kicked. But I feel like it's important for me that I don't unload that on her, that she doesn't become like a motherly figure for me or uh, somebody that I just dump all my problems on. It doesn't mean I don't communicate. We communicate really, really well, but it's important for me that she doesn't get put in a place where she feels like she has to solve my problems or put in a place where she has to deal with my stress. And people will say to me, I've got some pushback on social media when I've talked about this, like, no, your woman is your partner. You need to talk to her about everything. And I understand the sentiment in that, but I think that's kind of myopic. I don't need, for me as a man, I don't need my woman in her masculine energy. I need her in her feminine energy. That's what heals me. That's what puts me back together. That's what gets me back in fighting shape for the next day. So anything that I do to detract from that isn't just harmful for her. It's harmful for me as well, because when she's feminine and when she's safe and when she's got a hug and a kiss for me and she's, you know, talking to me and we're just connecting and she's, you know, we're enjoying a beautiful evening together. It, it, puts everything back together for me, whatever the day is brought. Like, that's just kind of like my healing balm is being with my wife at the end of the day and just like having her, her, yeah, kind of put me back together. So I think it's really, really important as men that we do look out for the physical safety of our women, but it's also really important that we make sure we don't, uh, damage or, or, uh, hurt their emotional energy as well, that we make sure we preserve and protect that at like every cost, any cost necessary, in my opinion. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing, so I mentioned the sleep thing, when I didn't feel safe, this is actually uh, quite recently, uh, where I was followed and uh, just my spidey senses where I got followed multiple turns, it was obvious. And uh, then the other thing is, when I was in the south, lived in, you know, South Florida for a period of time, gated community security, it's like I lost 10 pounds. And so when women are less stressed out, your skin's going to shine differently. Your body composition is going to shift because you're not in this high cortisol state. And that's something that we don't think about is like what actually happens is first things are going to impact you emotionally. Then they're going to impact your sleep. Then they're going to impact your hormones. Then you're going to see it on your skin. And then obviously in the body composition side of things and, that, and all that stuff, I don't use this word lightly it's going to shave time off your life. It's going to shave time off with your kids, with your family and doing what you're here to do in the world. Um, so I, I love what you're doing, Adam. I'm really excited for part two because basically we talked a little bit about like the fitnesses, the fitness, um, the, I would say the freedom is kind of part of that protection type of, um, element. So I, I'd love to dive into, you know, some of my other favorite F words. Yes. I know it's cheeky. I'm not crass. <laughs> Um, but but it's it's it, you know it gets the point across. So have I'd love uh, to have you back, and uh, we're we're short on time here. Um, where can people find you, Adam? Um, you can hit me up on social media, Adam Allard Official, across all the platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I really have enjoyed about traveling over the last little while is I get to see how different pockets operate. So I spent lots of time in California, lots of time in Arizona, Utah, South Florida, a little bit of time in Texas, 
and then uh, over in Europe. And then obviously have the Canadian perspective and things are so different in different places of the world and the culture and how the men and women are operating. So what I'm doing with all the, all this traveling and interviewing different health experts is kind of putting the pieces together, sort of picking and choosing the most relevant information that I think is going to help improve radiance. So thank you so much for adding to some of these layers and for those of you tuning in, I'm so thrilled that you're here. This is a little bit of more on the emotional and the masculine and feminine side of things. Um, but obviously to look and feel our best, we have to be you know, very mentally resilient and having that self-awareness and doing the deep inner work so that our subconscious um, things that we've been taught as we've been raised, um, attachment styles, different traumas we we shed light on things and then we we take what we want and we move forward in the right direction it's all about radiance is it's going to bring you the right people in the right way at the right time and i know you, you with the lds perspective appreciate that analogy as well lots of rights lots of right moves so for those of you here on the show thank you so much for joining check out the school of radiance for all of your skincare your tutorials the deeper sides of these things um, with the, which is the membership to truly cultivate your radiance um, in about a year. It takes time for your body and mind to kind of like catch up and sync up and integrate these things. And be sure to share this episode with a loved one. Be sure to follow Adam Alred on social media and look forward to having you back here again on the show, Adam. Thank you. Rachel, thanks so much for having me on. I look forward to coming back as well. Thank you.